share screen. And full screen. Okay, so the last class today. So uh, uh, the, the, I will be talking about topological defects, and if time allows, I will move on to also discussion of strong CP problem axion. If uh, 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 and and if there's not, not not enough time for it, I will uh, move some of the discussions the discussion section later today at 5 p.m. And of course, discussion section is about. Uh, you guys can ask any questions you like. So uh, the questions take priority, but if there's a uh, time uh, still needed, I will uh, cover some of this material. And if I actually happen to go through this material in class, then I, I try to cover something else, probably a spin systems or something. And uh, solution set, uh, I owe you the solution set for homework number six, and hopefully I will post that tomorrow. And uh, please, please fill out teaching evaluation. And uh, this is this semester, of course, has been a very unusual circumstances. But I'm afraid the online teaching will not be the last. And uh, you know, the things might start getting uh, somewhat closer to normal ne next semester. I hope. But uh, I'm sure there are instances where we have to go back to the online teaching one way or the other. So uh, I, I, I'd love to hear. Uh, what your experience has been. So uh, I, I urge you to fill out the teaching evaluation. And uh, also that there was some connection issue on Tuesday. And it seems to me that, uh, that my laptop had a problem, but my, my, but my iPad didn't. So uh, please let me know if you detect some connection issues, because in that case, I may actually switch to iPad instead. That seems to have a better connection speed than my laptop for some reason. So, uh, uh, so just just speak out if you uh, detect some connection issues. Okay. So, any questions about this? All right. A, so let me. Oh, right. Question. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, do you have a date? Do you have a date in mind uh, when you'd like to have us uh, upload all of our our homework grades? I think I have a few that I I hadn't graded yet. Oh, okay, so so uh, the uh, grades are due towards the third week of May, if I remember correctly. So I definitely need them in. Uh, so uh, I would say by the end of the second week of May. Okay, great. Is that okay? That's, that's very good. Yep. Okay, Sounds good. good. So I better to announce that by uh, uh, email to everybody. So by the end of second May, uh, second week of May, I need to have all the grades in so that I can report the, the grades uh, in, in the system on time. Any other questions? Okay. So I'd like to talk about topological defects. So uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about anomaly and the why anomaly is, is actually uh, supported by topological arguments. And uh, that the reason I actually talked about this, at least part of the reason, of course, anomaly itself is very important. Connection topology makes it exact and so on. But uh, also because I wanted to actually put this as a sort of a step, stepping stone towards talking about topological defects, because I did advertise on my syllabus that I, I would like, uh, actually talk about some of the topological stuff in, in class. And uh, so finally, we're getting to it. So what are the topological defects? So from what we have learned, the field theories are nonlinear. In many cases, we can't solve them. And sometimes we have to put them on a, a numerical simulation of the lattice. Sometimes we do come up with some clever approximations like large n to be able to solve them. But you know, it's never easy. And uh, so the one thing I try to emphasize is that in textbooks, you find so many things that can be done and we understand because that's something you can write about in textbooks. But I also wanted to, to, to uh, get it out there that, that there are so many things we don't understand, we cannot solve. And, and that's why the field theory is still you know, in, in the works and still uh, evolving and the people are still doing research on it. So uh, uh, you know, the, in general, we, we can solve most of the problems actually. And even at the classical level, if you have a field equation that's nonlinear, you can find solutions to them. And the one of the, the, the other millennium problems, I mentioned this Jan Mills gap problem as one of the millennium problems by the Cray Research Institute. Another one is to come up with solutions for Navier-Stokes uh, equation, which is the, the fundamental equation for the fluid mechanics. And, and once again, it's a nonlinear equation. It's totally classical physics, but there are so many things we don't understand like turbulence. 
So uh, in general, most problems or most equations or most systems in physics, you cannot solve. It turns out, this is once again topology, is something that can help us to find certain solutions because at least ahead of the time, we know certain solutions should exist. So in most cases, again, for example, things in obvious Stokes equation, we don't even have a clue what kind of solutions has to be there. But in, in certain cases, topology actually helps us in that regard. That's why we do talk about topology as yet additional help for us to understand the field theory. And uh, in particular, certain solutions which do exist because of certain non-trivial nature uh, because of topology uh, appear actually quite a bit in an important fashion in condensed matter physics, particle physics, also in astrophysics, cosmology, and the nuclear physics as well. So the topological defects turns out to be a very important and also common subject to many areas of physics. So that's why we talk about them. Any questions so far? Well, of course, everything I said so far is very abstract, so I need to make them very concrete. So yeah, you're welcome to ask questions at any moment. So uh, when are the topological defects important? So uh, we talked a lot about the symmetry breaking spontaneously. So uh, when a symmetry breaks, it chooses a ground state out of the many, and that's basically the definition of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. The ground state is degenerate. Uh, sometimes there are infinite number of them for continuous symmetries. The system has to pick one. So suppose you start with, let's say, high temperature where symmetry is not broken, and you cool the system, and then you have to pick a particular ground state. But when you are cooling the system, which may happen in the laboratory, which may happen in the universe, while you are cooling the system, then different parts of the system may end up choosing different ground states. And that's something you are familiar with. For example, if you are uh, 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 cooling water to make ice cubes, then if you actually do it too fast, then you'll find ice cubes that are full of sort of a, a clouds and, and not very clear. Sometimes you really see the crystal structure are not matching together very well. And that's because if you cool the system too quickly, different parts of the system end up choosing different ground states, and there's a mismatch among them. And that mismatch is what we call topological defects. And so that's what I will start talking about now. So any questions about this intuition here? So when you start with a system which has certain symmetry, you cool the system, you go below critical temperature, then different parts of the system start choosing different ground states of the system uh, when there's a spontaneous symmetry breaking. And so one region with one ground state, another region uh, chooses different ground state, and there's a mismatch between them. So that is what ends up being topological defects. Is, so, is the, as, oh, uh, go ahead, Eric, go ahead. So I was curious, is the thing that prevents topological defects from forming in this cooling process ensuring that the cooling is adiabatic or is there some other constraint on the cooling? Um, so there's a, a, a sort of the, 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 the fight between what is called the time scale for relaxation versus how quickly you cool the system. So uh, there is an argument by originally by Kibble and then expanded by Zurich. Uh, Zurich is the uh, guy who uh, talked about the co decoherence of, of the quantum measurement systems at Los Alamos. And so the idea is that when you come close to the temperature of the second or phase transition, we talked a lot about how the critical exponents work and how the correlation length diverges. So uh, when the correlation length diverges, it turns out that what is called the relaxation time also diverges, namely that it would take an infinite amount of time for the system to relax to be cut, reach an equilibrium. And when different parts of system chooses different ground states, the system is not in equilibrium, but it doesn't reach equilibrium very quickly because of this uh, infinite relaxation time. So it turns out that uh, there's also a compa comparison between the two how quickly you're cooling the system versus how quickly the system can sort of adjust and relaxes to the equilibrium situation. And if the, the cooling speed is faster than that, then the system ends up having lots of these topological defects. So that's the sort of competition between the two timescales. Does that answer your question? Was it Eric? Yeah, that answers my question. 
Yeah, okay, that good. answers my question. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, somebody else was asking a question. Was that Andres? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, if a particular example would be like when you have like this, like a solution, and then you cool it down while it's saturated. But you know, like, if you don't stir it too much, sometimes you can cool it down below its saturation point, right? But it's like an unstable ground state. So would that be one of those examples? Is that is like phase transitions, some kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking in that sense? Uh, let's see. So I, I'm not totally clear on the, the question you're asking. So maybe once we get to some examples, uh, you can ask questions in the context of that examples. Like I hope I can answer them more uh, uh, appropriately. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So any other questions about this basic idea? Okay. So let me get to examples. The first example is what is called domain wall. So just imagine that you're talking about one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. In Hazel Lagrangian, it's a scalar field theory, uh, scalar klein golden field phi. And as you can see, you know, the, we know what those bunch of parameters lambda and g for now, then this is just a double well potential. So phi has two minima as depicted by this potential in, in this plot. So uh, uh, bringing these parameters back in, so the minima are where phi is inverse g. And, and I don't know, you know, this is actually not my notation, somebody else chose a notation just for the sake of uh, getting the solutions look uh, pretty. But anyway, so, uh, so th this is the double well potential. So lambda squared over g squared is the steepness of the potential and the, the expectation value of phi at the minima at inverse g. So you have two solutions for the ground states here. And uh, the thing here is that, as we, I just talked about on a previous slide, suppose you cool down the system, and uh, the, this is one dimensional uh, system. So let's say the left-handed side of the system chooses the ground state of negative G inverse, and right-hand half of the system chooses the ground state to be positive G inverse, and there's a mismatch in between. So it turns out that this uh, the Lagrangian, of course, uh, you can write down the equation motion for this, uh, has a non-trivial solution, which is clearly a non-linear system, but you can nonetheless find exact analytic solution to this, which happens to be tench. So the idea here is that when x goes to negative infinity, that's the, the limit of going to the left, then the tench of the negative number in the limit goes to negative one. So phi uh, goes to a symptotic limit of negative one over g, that's one of the minima. And if x goes to positive infinity, tangent goes to plus one. So the phi asymptotes to plus one over g. That's the other minimum. So this solution interpolates one minimum to the other. So this is what I was trying to show in this picture here. So this is just the uh, potential energy. I, I plotted so, so sideways so that you know the phi axis, that's a vertical axis that corresponds to this minima, uh, one of the minima at the, uh, the leftmost limit, and the other minimum uh, when you go to the rightmost limit. So this solution really does interpolate between one minimum to the other one. And in between, there's this mismatch where phi actually ends up vanishing. And this is sort of the quite typical of a uh, topological defects, namely that this kind of solution exists because there are multiple minima to the solution, there are multiple ground states and spontaneous symmetry breaking. But if you find a solution that makes use of the space of ground states to find a non-trivial solution, somewhere in the middle, the symmetry actually gets restored, namely phi vanishes. So uh, this is one of such a solution which corresponds to a topological defect and this is one dimensional space. So if you actually extend this solution to three dimensional space, then let's say this is a Z axis and the X and Y axis are trivial in the sense that nothing changes along those directions. Then this mismatch would extend all the way as an X, Y plane in three dimensional space. And that's why this is called domain wall. So this looks like a wall in three dimensional space and at the value z equals zero, there's something non-trivial going on. That's where you switch from one minimum to the other one. 
And so uh, as in three dimensional system, that would end up being a wall on X, Y plane where the energy density is localized. So that's the idea of the domain wall. And the reason why such a solution exists is, is topological, as you can see immediately, namely that there are two different minima. And so the coset space of the vacua, in this case, you start with a, a system with a Z2 symmetry, and Z2 symmetry is spontaneously broken to no symmetry left. So the G mod H is Z2 itself. And there's a homotopy group, uh, which we haven't talked about, called pi naught, and that's even below pi one. So in this case, you're talking about the map from zero dimensional sphere to the space G mod H, Zero dimensional space is nothing but just a point. So uh, any map from a point to a space can be classified by how many points there are in that space. And G mod H is space of ground states. And here you know that there are two points in the space of ground states. So pi naught of G mod H is nothing but two points, namely Z2. So whenever you have a system where space of ground states consists of disconnected parts, then pi naught is non-trivial because you can count how many different points there are up to some continuous uh, changes. So if they're discrete points, like in this case, Z2, then pi naught is Z2. Even if you have a continuous spaces, but if the continuous spaces come in two disconnected parts, for example, uh, uh, um, what's, what is the example? I can't think of one right now. So, yeah, so I can't think of an example right now. But anyway, so if, even if you have continuous spaces, if they come in a, 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 in the sum of disconnected parts, pi naught is non-trivial, then you can talk about some solutions that interpolates between different disconnected parts of the ground states. And hence, you have a topological defect or topological solitons. And this kind of solution is called soliton, which refers to sort of solitary waves. And if I know the history uh, uh, well enough, then the soliton was discovered actually in fluid di dynamics first. And, and so in most cases, like a Schrodinger equation, if you have a wave packet, wave packet was spread out very quickly. But in the fluid mechanics with a nonlinear equation, unlike Schrodinger equation that's linear, you can find a solution which, is, which doesn't dissipate, which doesn't sp spread out, and states sort of the, the maintains its shape. And tsunami is an, a famous example of this. Tsunami is a, a wave where there's an enormous mass of water that sort of goes above the sea level. So it's a mass of the water, and it just moves it, it, with a sh uh, uh, the, without changing its shape. That's why a big earthquake in Chile might end up causing devastation in Eastern Asia because it doesn't dissipate. So if something dissipates on the, the surface of the ocean, then of course the, the power should go down like one over R. But for soliton that doesn't change the shape, it, it doesn't go like one over R, it stays the same power. And that's why it causes a humongous damage uh, when on the receiving end of the tsunami. So this is one example of such a soliton solution. So you can actually boost the solution because this uh, Lagrangian is Lorentz invariant. Then you find this domain wall or defect moving with certain speed, but it never changes its shape. It always stay intact in this particular shape of the solution. And hence it's a soliton solution. So generically, we talk about topological soliton, namely that you find a solution to nonlinear field equation, which is just doesn't dissipate, which keeps its shape intact as it moves, and hence a soliton. And the existence of soliton solution uh, is supported by non-trivial topology, and hence a topological soliton. And so what you're seeing here is sort of the, the most simplest example of such a soliton in the nonlinear field equation. Okay, so any questions about this? Now this is very concrete. Uh, yeah, so if you were to shift the potential upward just a tiny little bit, then your solution will have infinite energy, right? 
Um, yeah, but the, the, uh, unless uh, the uh, system couples to gravity, where the gravity cares about absolute value of the energy, field theory by itself doesn't care about the absolute uh, value of the, the, the basic origin of the energy scale. So if you just shift the potential energy upwards or downwards, uh, you're right, uh, it ends up having a infinite energy, positive or negative, uh, at the face value, but it's not going to affect any of the dynamics we're talking about here. Uh, okay, so you can choose the, the, the zero as you right. wish. Right. Okay. Again, except for the coupling to gravity, which has to do with this cosmological constant problem in dark energy. Uh, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. But uh, uh, for the, all the field theory problems by itself, then the, the uh, origin of zero doesn't really matter. Thank you. Okay, any other questions here? And it, it, it's an, a good exercise to just plug in this solution into the equation of motion and verify that this is indeed a solution because you would appreciate how non-trivial that is. That something like a tangent function, if you plot it, it seems sort of uh, very reasonable. But if you want to actually solve the equation of motion, then it, it's actually not easy to figure this functional form out. So uh, I, I really encourage you to actually just plug that in to equation motion and verify that that is indeed a solution to it. So now that we do know that such a, uh, a non-trivial solution exists, let me look at actually physical examples where domain walls are exhibited. And the one example is a polymer, uh, polyacetylene. So uh, the polyacetylene uh, they actually relies on this double bond between two carbon atoms, blue and red, connected to hydrogen outside. So uh, this blue carbon atom, for example, has this single bond to the other carbon, double bond to the other carbon, and carbon always has four bonds. So the fourth bond goes to hydrogen, which is not shown in this picture. I just happened to find it on the web. So every carbon atom has four bonds. And the interesting thing here is that whether you have double bond on this side or that side, is you know arbitrary so the polyacetylene has this z2 symmetry to choose whether you want to have a double bond going this way or double bond going that way and because it's a polymer if you happen to choose double bond to go that way the next chain would also need to have the double bond going the same way so it ends up the entire system spontaneously broke the z2 symmetry so this is very much analogous to what I talked about in the previous slide. Uh, that is actually a field theory limit. That if you take the continuum limit, turns out to be exactly the kind of Lagrangian I talked about in the previous slide. You have a double well potential. Field chooses one vacuum or the other, and uh, there is a symmetry breaking of Z two. And given that there is Z two symmetry, you can have another ground state where the double bond actually goes in this direction rather than that direction. So this part of the system chooses the other ground state. And here is the soliton or domain wall. So this carbon atom is frustrated because it doesn't have enough bonds it is supposed to have. It has only one bond here, another bond here. There's presumably hydrogen atom down here. So one bond is missing. So in some sense, this carbon atom is in an unstable situation. But it can resolve this frustration very easily because if you want to resolve the frustration and trying to switch, for example, this bond to a double bond, then it requires this carbon atom to give up this double bond and switch to this single bond to double bond, and this one the same, and so on and so forth. We have to end up changing macroscopic number of bonds if this carbon atom wants to resolve the frustration. So it doesn't happen very easily, as you can imagine, and therefore this situation happens to be rather stable. And so, hence, this is actually a solitary way or soliton where you can have this non-trivial configuration, which is definitely not the ground state, which is not minimum at the energy, that nonetheless turns out to be stable, and, and then it stays that way. 
So that actually creates a wall separating the left half of the system with the double bones going that way, and right half of the system with double bones, bones go that way. And in between, there is a, a, a point where Z2 symmetry is not broken because left and right looks the same for this carbon atom. And symmetry is restored in between, and that is a soliton solution. So that's a concrete example where such a domain wall can form in a system where the system has a Z2 symmetry that's spontaneously broken by either of these ground states. Okay, any questions about this? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, Nick. It, it probably is easier to explain from the previous slide. Uh, so do, do we know any uh, time dependent solutions, at least classical solutions. Uh, say if we look at the previous one plus one dimensional Lagrangian, where it interpolates from this tanch to, uh, to just being like plus one over G. So you can imagine that over time, uh, so, this does right, so, shift maybe to the left out to infinity or something. Uh -huh. Good, good, good. Thank you for asking the question. So, this field theory is, uh, uh, you know, clearly a uh, Lorentz invariant. So I can perform a Lorentz boost to a solution. And this solution is a static solution that doesn't depend on time. But if we do a Lorentz boost, that ends up being a time dependent solution. The only thing we have to do then is to switch this X to uh, gamma X minus gamma beta T. So that gives you a moving solution with the velocity beta. So then this, the a domain wall in the middle happens to be moving either left to the right. And so uh, in, 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 in addition, you can also have this solution and another solution that goes the other way, uh, far away, then this solution is sometimes called a kink solution because you know, at, in the limit where you actually make this transition steep, then it looks like you have a step function from negative to positive values. And you have the anti-kink somewhere else. And then the kink and anti-kink will start to attract with each other and they would annihilate. And they are such time dependent solutions too. And, it, it, and I am not going to actually talk about this, uh, but it, it is actually already in the lecture note. So when you actually look at this kind of kink solution, this kink starts to behave like a fermion, and anti-kink like an anti-fermion. And uh, the classical solution where kink and anti-kink would end up annihilating with each other uh, actually ends up being the process of fermion anti fermion annihilation, just like what we do in Dirac uh, field theory. So that they, you can certainly find time-dependent solutions, whether this one soliton is moving left or right, or soliton solutions annihilating the anti-soliton solutions, or you can create soliton and anti-soliton as a pair, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's the way you can find whole sort of uh, time-dependent solutions to this differential equation. Cool. Is that a kind of answer you were looking for? Uh, I, I think so, yeah. Okay, good, good. All right, any other questions here? So in the case of polymer, that's intrinsically one-dimensional system. So uh, talking about one-dimensional field theory makes sense, but you can extend this to higher dimensions too. So Ising model has these two minima, and this is again just a numerical simulation I happen to find on the web, but just do a Google search, and so red, is the region where the spin is pointing upwards. Blue is where spin is pointing downwards. And here's the mismatch. And this is, you know, as you can see, is a time dependent uh, situation where domain walls are fluctuating uh, because of the temperature, but they don't seem to disappear very quickly. So imagine that this uh, Ising model system has, has a macroscopic size that you have large number of spins along the wall and to make this large number of spins uh, having this domain wall solution to move together so that this kink over here and anti-kink over here would completely against each other would take an enormous amount of time because you have to really move uh, the, the, the large number of objects. So that's how you can see that the domain walls uh, can form in Ising model because of the Z2 symmetry of the system, and those domain walls are fairly stable 
even when you have a soliton and anti-soliton together, because it that ends up having a basically macroscopic mass uh, in a uh, uh, embedded into three or two dimensional systems for this. So one dimensional soliton is already fairly stable, as we have seen in polyacetylene. If you actually extend to the even higher dimensions, then that ends up having a macroscopic mass uh, corresponding to the size of the uh, transverse dimensions. Uh, so if this is z dimension, there's y and, and x, uh, x and y dimensions that transverse. And uh, uh, so the domain walls can become a, uh, a you know really non-trivial and uh, stable uh, configurations uh, uh, in field theory or whatever system you're looking at. So uh, these are examples of domain walls. Any questions about this? Okay, so let me just emphasize one more time that the existence of this solution is supported by this topology, namely that space of ground states has disconnected parts which correspond to the homotopy group pi naught. And if you're looking at one spatial dimension, then the ends of space, left and right, are two disconnected points. And then you are looking at the map of mapping these disconnected points, two of them at infinities, onto the space of ground states. And that's why we use this pi naught of the coset space as a way of figuring out non-trivial classes of this, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, soliton solutions. So, uh, the basic lesson we learn here <clears throat> is that you first figure out <clears throat> what the infinity of the space is. So in one dimension, the infinity of space is two disconnected points. If you go to two dimensions, infinity of space is a circle, that's S1. So that, then you start looking for pi1, namely map from infinity, which is S1, into the space of the ground states. If you have three-dimensional system, infinity is a two-dimensional sphere, then you're looking for non-trivial maps from two-dimensional sphere to the space of ground states, and pi two, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and this is the lowest dimensional example of this. So what I would like to do is sort of systematically go up in dimensions and, and look at examples where such a defect can form, non-trivial solutions can exist as a result of this non-trivial topology mapping the infinity of space onto the space of possible ground states. So uh, the Z2 symmetry breaking, I mentioned this Ising model and the polymer. Uh, you can also write down a, uh, a field theory example. And I mentioned this because that's partly because it's a, a one, uh, two of the problems in Peshkin Schroeder. Here are the problem sets. And also because this field theory, which consists of N massless fermions with attractive interaction among them, uh, exhibits dimensional transmutation. So this system has no dimensional four coupling constant. Coupling constant G, which is the attractive force, is dimensionless coupling constant. If you work out the mass dimension of the fermion, that's one half in one plus one dimension. And system, uh, this system has both UN symmetry and also discrete Z2 symmetry, which corresponds to multiplying fermion by gamma five, which switches the sign of this psi by psi uh, by linear. And uh, clearly, psi by, psi by linear comes in squared in this Lagrangian. So this Z2 symmetry is a symmetry of the Lagrangian. But once you actually analyze the system in the large N limit, uh, which you can do uh, based on the, the technique you already learned uh, earlier in the class, then you can uh, introduce the auxiliary field to rewrite this quadric uh, uh, interaction in terms of the Yukawa interaction and uh, 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 by linear for the auxiliary field, you compute the effective potential for the by auxiliary field, and you find a non trivial minimum. It turns out that the, the, the location of the minimum has to do with actually a negative beta function where coupling G runs to a larger value at the infrared, it blows up some value, and that's the energy scale where psi by psi actually ends up having a, a condensate, and that also breaks the Z2 symmetry spontaneously. And the fermion, as a result, ends up being massive by dimensional transmutation, namely that the system without any dimensional full constant ends up having a dimension full energy scale where the mass gap is generated. So in some sense, this is sort of the, a, a, uh, the exactly solvable analog 
to the, uh, uh, the superconductivity I will also mention later on, where the fermion pair actually has a condensate. And we also talked about the QCD exhibiting the same kind of condensate oxide oxide. So in some sense, this is actually a toy model QCD where you can see all of the natures of the, the, the QCD happening, negative beta function, uh, and uh, the, the generation of the mass scale, and uh, the side oxide condensate, and all of these things which do happen in QCD, we believe, uh, can be exactly analyzed in this gross nouveau model. So in this model, again, you can find Z2 symmetry breaking and therefore domain wall solutions as well. So this is just one QFT example, uh, which really exhibits the kind of things that I mentioned using the polymerizing model on the previous slide. Okay, any questions about this? All right, and I actually uploaded the, uh, the solutions I wrote for these problem sets on the B courses. So uh, I, uh, I, 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 I really encourage you to actually look at those solutions. So now I'm going one dimension higher. So now I'm talking about the two spatial dimensions and two plus one dimensional systems. And then the infinity of space is a circle, namely S1. So we expect that there may be something interesting when the space of ground states is also S1. And that's exactly what happens when you have a system with U1 symmetry that you know, breaks spontaneously. So the, the, the prototypical example we talked about already in class is the Bose-Einstein condensate that ends up being a superfluid. And so uh, you can have, for example, dilute gas of cold atoms like rubidium and sodium these are examples people study early on in the, the, the study of the dilute gas of cold atoms. And then you, you can describe it using this Schrodinger field theory, non relativistic field theory, where psi is a scalar field, boson field, and, and has a U1 symmetry. You can change the phase of psi, and Lagrangian remains invariant. But when the chemical potential mu is positive, then potential energy is the, the negative of this Lagrangian, so the potential energy now has unstable origin. And the psi field ends up having an expectation value with an arbitrary phase, and this arbitrariness of the phase is the uh, manifestation of spontaneous symmetry breaking, namely you have now an infinite number of ground states parameterized by theta. So the space of ground states is now uh, uh, given by this phase, and therefore they form a, a circle. And then you can talk about the map of the infinity of space onto this circle, wrapping around multiple times. Then you expect to see some non-trivial soliton solution. And we talked about this Bogoliubov spectrum of the excitation, which is described by the lecture note. So uh, that's not very important for the discussion today. But uh, I just wanted to uh, put it out there that we do understand this system fairly well. And then you can ask the question whether such a soliton can really exist. So any questions about uh, this uh, introduction uh, to the uh, bose einstein condensate? OK. So now we look for the solutions. So, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether the system is relativistic or non relativistic because we are looking for static solutions. The difference in time derivatives doesn't really matter. So, in the non relativistic case, time derivatives is the linear order in the field. Uh, I'm sorry, the linear time derivative acting on the field. In a relativistic case, you have uh, two powers of time derivatives, but uh, as I said, it doesn't really matter. And so what we have, uh, the most important thing here, is that in this case, the field acquires a expectation value with an arbitrary phase. Therefore, the ground state uh, forms a, the bottom of this potential, that's a circle, S1. And infinity of space for two dimensions is also a circle. Therefore, you're talking about the map from infinity of space, S1, onto the space of ground states, that's S1, which can be characterized by this winding number. So the, to be more explicit, we are looking for a solution where the complex scalar field phi as a function of the polar coordinates r and theta would behave like expectation value v at the infinity where energy is supposed to go back to the ground state. But as you go around on the plane, 
then at the infinity, the phase of the field also goes around once. Namely, that infinity of space, which is parameterized by polar and uh, the azimuth angle theta, maps onto the space of the ground states, which is given by the phase of the scalar field. So this example is where the S1 infinity of space wraps around the S1, that space of ground states, exactly once. And given this ground state, you can just go ahead and solve the equation of motion, and you find a solution like this. So this is based on the ansatz that uh, the, the field is some function of r times e to the i theta. So at every radii, then the field actually wraps around the surface of ground states once. And the, at infinity, then the size of the amplitude as if tones to one, that's exactly what the expectation value V is. I took the unit where V is one. But at the origin, phi vanishes, and that's where the symmetry is actually restored. Very similar to what we talked about the King solution uh, in the one dimensional case. The symmetry is restored at the center of this non trivial solution. And you can also work out on two dimensions the velocity field. So if you work out the U1 current, which is the motion of the atoms in the case of the uh, cold, dilute gas of cold atoms, and in the case of this uh, relativistic field theory, that's the neutral current for the U1 symmetry we talked about. And the U1 symmetry uh, is broken, but there is actually current flowing, which circles around the origin. And therefore, this velocity field that goes around once, around the center, and that's why this is called the vortex, just like a vortex you see in the fluid mechanics. And, uh, the, it, and when you actually plug in this solution back into the Lagrangian, you can compute the total energy of the system, which actually turns out to be log division. And that the divisions come from actually long distances. And that has to do with the fact that when you have a vortex, an anti-vortex somewhere else, there's a logarithmic attractive potential between them. So if you try to separate the anti-vortex far away from the vortex, then the vortex by itself ends up having a log diversion potential. And so that's something you have actually used when we talked about why renormalization is needed even in classical systems. And when the log divergence has to do with the renormalization of the energy or mass of the system. And uh, so we talked about this log diversion, uh, 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 the attractive potential there. And this is actually concrete example field theory that does lead to this log diversion energy. But apart from this log divergence, you can find this solution. And then it has this vorticity that the velocity field goes around. And, and you can find this non-trivial solution to equation motion, again, supported by topology, because the, uh, uh, you have this non-trivial map going from the infinity of two-dimensional space, that's S1, onto the space of ground states, that's also S1, characterized by this uh, winding number. So if you want to look at the multi-vortex solution, you can change this e to the i theta to e to the i n theta uh, with an arbitrary integer n. And, and you can still find a solution uh, like that. Okay, any questions about this uh, field theory? And the next slide is about the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 examples you can see actually in the experiments. So you know how that, at least classically, if that was a fluid, that vortex can choose to either spin around clockwise or counterclockwise? Mm -hmm. Is that one of the origins of the Z symmetry? Or, or, or I guess the homotopy group being Z? Um, I don't, well, so yeah, uh, you're actually right. So you can define sort of the, uh, the loop integral of the velocity, which happens to be one of these topological invariants given by integers. So once you have this velocity field, you can define a loop integral of the velocity field over a circle. And then I didn't show it here, but you can see it sort of by your eyes that uh, this derivative at a fixed radius, we'll pick the theta derivative, and phi is a constant at a given radius. So if you go around, then it picks up basically the derivative of theta integrated over space, which ends up being how much theta changes by going around the circle, that's two pi. Uh, 
So that's the way you can define a topological invariant, which is an integer, by using this velocity field. And that is what is called the vorticity, which happens to be quantized because of that. OK, I see. Thank you. OK. Any other questions here? OK, so uh, this kind of vortex is something you really do see in uh, real examples. So the, this is actually an example of superfluid liquid uh, helium-4. And uh, I think I mentioned this earlier uh, in a different context. So you produce this superfluid uh, liquid helium-4, basically just uh, cooling the liquid all the way down to a very low temperature. And then uh, you, you have this uh, superfluid in a bucket in your experiment. And then you start to rotate the bucket. And then you start to form this one vortex. And, and as, and as I, I responded to Andrew's question just a minute ago, uh, the, the number of vortices, of course, comes in the integer multiples. So the vorticity, of course, comes in a quantized fashion. So here's the emergence of one vortex. And then if you look at the bucket further, <clears throat> you start forming more vortices. And you can keep increasing number of vortices in the system. And they end up lining up very neatly in this triangle lattice. And that's because, uh, because of the logarithmic uh, diversion energy, the vortex and vortex has a logarithmic potential, repulsive potential between them. The vortex anti-vortex attracts by logarithmic potential. Vortex and vortex repels each other by the logarithmic potential. Uh, that's because basically that's a coulomb potential in two dimensions, as you have looked at before. And so uh, uh, to minimize the energy, despite this repulsive uh, potential, they line up uh, a, a, a with this maximal packing, namely the triangular lattice. So that's what happens uh, for vortices for the, uh, the super free lithium uh, helium-4. And you can do the same thing with the cold atom BEC. Again, you see the triangular lattice of the vortices. So the vortices is something you can really create in these systems where U1 symmetry is spontaneously broken, and that, that you don't need to know, know much details about the system. Again, topology is very powerful. Once you know that U1 symmetry is broken, you have this two-dimensional system, then you know that there is a non-trivial topological winding number you can define on the system, and that leads to the non-trivial solutions, therefore, these vortices. So that this is something you can really see in laboratory, and, and that is an example of how this uh, non-trivial winding number of the spatial infinity, S1, is mapped into the space of uh, ground states that's also S1, characterized by the winding numbers, which is the number of vortices you can count in these pictures. OK, any questions? <clears throat> Sorry, I have one more question. Right. Um, you know, you know when you have like certain molecules that are stabilized by having several benzene rings because they have this resonance? Mm -hmm. They sort of look like those vortices inside like the BEC. So can you generally expect that vortices will stabilize something or does it just depend on their relative orientations? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, the sta sta stabilized against what? Well, let's see. If <clears throat> The way I'm trying to understand it is if I have a benzene ring and I know mm -hmm. that the electrons are in resonance between the structures, right. then it usually stabilizes the molecule a lot more. So what I'm wondering is, are vortices similar to that is that they can like stabilize a configuration or if there's more than one, can they probably destroy it or? Mm. So I, I, I'm still not clear, but let me, let me talk a little bit of a benzene ring. Uh, so this Keclé structure uh, uh, can have two different configurations where double bonds are. And so there's a Z2 symmetry between them, uh, just like what we talked about the polyacetylene. But it, it does, it's not a macroscopic system. It only has six carbon atoms on a, on a benzene ring. So it's, it's actually a double well potential for a quantum mechanics, because the number of degrees of freedom is rather low, and in quantum mechanics, then you can tunnel from one ground state to another. And so uh, you have actually two uh, uh, states where you put two ground states in symmetric sum, so ground state one plus ground state two, or asymmetric sum, ground state one minus ground state two, and it turns out the symmetric combination is lower energy than the anti-symmetric combination. And that is what people call resonance. It's just a linear superposition of two ground states 
degenerate by Z2. And uh, you form this superposition because for a, a system with small degree of freedom, <coughs> tunneling amplitude is uh, large enough so that you have to form this symmetric combination. And what is going on here in this field theory is that the number of degrees of freedom, you know, up to a good approximation is infinite, rather. So the forming the, uh, the linear superpotential ground states is impractical because of the macroscopic number in the system. And that's why we can pretend the system chooses a particular ground state rather than the superpositions of them. So that is the sort of basis where we can actually study this field theory, assuming that every infinity of space picks up a particular ground state, rather than the linear superpositions of them, and find these non-trivial solutions. So there's a major difference between benzene ring and a superfluid, where benzene ring has only six carbon atoms, the, the superfluid may have a million atoms, and, and so the million is closer to infinity than six, and so we can pretend that linear superposition is not necessary, and, and hence you can use this full theory example to work out the solutions of these vortices. I'm not sure I'm addressing your question, Andres. I, I well, tried no, to, uh, no yeah. that, that, does, that does make sense. I, but I was more thinking about like bigger molecules that are made out of benzene rings. Like, you know how over here we're not really looking at an infinity, but we're looking at like maybe a hundred of those like different little oh, points, right? Oh, I see. But like if you have something like cholesterol, which has like a whole bunch of rings to it, there, mm -hmm. would, be some, there would be some points where you can have resonance. So I'm I wondering see. that can that stabilize the whole system altogether or is there conditions for it to destroy it and so forth? Okay, so then I don't know the answer to your question. So I'm just not familiar with if there is a, a, a kind of a Z2 symmetry breaking happening in those uh, big molecules. So the polyacetylene is an example I knew about and it does happen for the, the huge collection of benzene rings. If, if each of the benzene rings are correlated in a way that they all choose a particular orientation altogether is the question here. And I just don't know. So my impression has been that individual uh, benzene rings are sort of independent from each other. <clears throat> so there's no correlation among this choice of Z2 among the different benzene rings in a, a big molecule. So I didn't expect that to happen, but I, I just don't know if that's possible. Okay, so okay, that, that's fair. I'll keep looking into it then. Yeah. So the question is really about whether different benzene rings have correlated orientation among each other on a macroscopic system. And if they can, then I, I believe that uh, you can is exhibit similar behavior. Okay, thank you. I, I think okay. if you draw, draw out the chemical structures, they look very similar to the example you, you just gave, the poly. Oh, is that right? Oh, that's great. So you, you actually uh, found it? Yeah, that's why I was asking. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Great, so uh, the, please share that with us. So this is the case of the global U1 symmetry. But you can also make the U1 symmetry local, namely you can gauge U1. And we talked about this already just a, uh, uh, this uh, last Tuesday, namely that once you have a system that has spontaneous breaking of U1 symmetry, but if the U1 is gauged, then that leads to the Higgs mechanism was a superconductivity in, in the case of a non rivetic system. So in the superconductivity you can make in a laboratory, that's a bose einstein condensate of the Cooper pairs of two electrons. So each uh, boson has now charge 2E, and you have the positive chemical potential for them, so you do have this ground state. Again, the space of ground states is S1. And in this case, we have actually talked about this already, that uh, <coughs> the, the vector potential acquires a mass term, and therefore it becomes short-ranged, and that's the Meissner effect. And the, uh, the, uh, the B field dies off exponentially with a characteristic distance that corresponds to this London penetration depth. So that's what we talked about already. So situation is pretty much the same. You have a symmetry U1, the spontaneously broken. So you can map the infinity of space, which is S1, onto the space of ground states, that's S1, and therefore you can talk about the winding number. And uh, that is what is called Abrikosov flux. And Abrikosov received Nobel Prize for this uh, 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 like eight or nine years ago. It's not that far a uh, 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 <coughs> long time before. <coughs> and uh, the same topology. So the space of ground state, G mod H, 
is U1, because U1 is spontaneous broken, which is nothing but S1. Infinity for space is S1, so you can characterize this mapping by the winding number. A major difference from the case of the global U1 symmetry is now you can find a solution with finite energy. So boundary condition at the infinity is still the same. And uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to solve the numerical solution numerically on general grounds, but it, there's a particular value of this phi to the fourth coupling, where twice the coupling happens to be exactly the same thing as the charge squared, and for the BCS, that's 4E squared, then you can actually find that the equation of motion breaks it down to linear equations instead of quadratic equations that's easier to solve, and that's what I did over here. So the phi, the scalar field, uh, starts with zero. So at the origin symmetries, again, are uh, uh, restored, but quickly asymptotes to the expectation value at infinity. And that's normalized to be one in this plot. And vector potential also vanishes at the origin, but uh, asymptotes to a particular value at infinity. And uh, then you can also plot the velocity field. The velocity field depends also on the vector potential because the covariant derivative includes the vector potential in there, and it looks like this. And one, you, you actually appreciate the difference from the case of the global symmetry where velocity field was large at the large distances. Here, velocity field starts to die off. And that's because this combination of the covariant derivative seems close to zero, so that the, the uh, energy density also assumes to zero at infinity, and, and that leads to the finite energy integral, uh, integrated over the entire space, the two-dimensional space. So as a result, uh, you can find this vortex solution. And once you have this, uh, the, 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 the azimuthal component the vector potential goes now going around in loop, then that is a sign that there is a magnetic flux going through it. And this, what's plotted in green, is the size of the magnetic field as a function of radius. And it starts with one in certain unit and, and dies off again. But the whole integral of the B field is, is finite. And the homework problem is asking you to actually work that out. So the, the magnetic flux is the integral of the B field, which is quantized in the unit of two pi h bar over the charge of the condensate times an integer. And the reason why that happens is that, as I emphasized already, that this is the finite energy configuration. Therefore, covariant derivative of the field phi should go to zero at the infinity. But the phi has this phase variation at the infinity. So derivative would pick up the derivative of theta, which needs to be then compensated by field A at the infinity. And that's why a theta also approaches one in that same unit. And when EA, that's the azimuthal component of vector potential, has this form to compensate for the phase variation of phi, so this is uniquely defined once you fix this phase variation, then you can compute the magnetic flux, uh, the, the, the area integral, by again using the Stokes theorem, you can rewrite it as a loop integral of the vector potential. And you know the form of the vector potential to cancel this phase variation of phi to get an, a finite energy configuration, then that integrates to actually 2 pi. Hence, the magnetic flux is 2 pi over q, as I shown here. So the, the, uh, you, you are being asked to actually work this out yourself, namely just by knowing this boundary condition at the infinity. You can already tell what the total magnetic flux is in this flux at the, uh, the vortex solution. And hence, that is called a of flux because it comes with the quantized magnetic flux in the unit of 2 pi h bar over q. So any questions about this? Uh, so can you explain your like writing on the type 1 and type 2 here? Yeah, I haven't explained it yet. So let me, let me mention that now. So when G is exactly Q squared over two, as I mentioned, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the equation motion becomes simple. They become linear differential equations, and that's easier to solve. And that is the case of what is called the BPS solution. And BPS stands for uh, the name of the people 
in Bogomomi Parad and uh, I forgot S, um, I'm sorry. But anyway, so that's what it's called a BPS solution. And if for this solution, you can also show that energy of the multi vortex solution is precisely N times a single vortex solution, which means that vortex and vortex do not have any forces between them. When you change the value of G though, then it's not a BPS solution anymore. You have to solve numerically second order differential equation in that case. When G is smaller, then G is, if you remember, is a repulsive force in the scale of field. When G is smaller, then actually the attractive force to the gate interaction wins. And then the vortex and vortex starts to attract with each other. So single vortex is rather unstable. You, you actually end up forming a large number of vortex coming together, and that actually ends up breaking the superconductivity as a whole because the condensate is no longer stable. And that's the type one superconductor. On the other hand, when G is larger than Q squared over two, then the vortex would repel at each other. And therefore, this is a situation you can form again, a triangular lattice of vortices. So in this case, you can have a stateful configuration where magnetic flux can go through the superconductor. They punch through it in the form of these vortices. And then you have a, uh, uh, a system with the uh, magnetic field punching through the superconductor. And that is what is called a type two superconductor. So the difference between type one and type two is whether vortices would attract each other or repel each other. And when they do repel each other, then you can have a configuration with magnetic fields punching through a piece of superconductor, which is shown on the next slide. But anyway, thank you for asking the question, Tian Lei. So that's the, uh, the situation depending on the size of these coupling constants. For the BPS solution, G is exactly Q squared over two. Then you have the linear differential equations and the uh, energy of the multi-vortex is precisely n times the energy of the single vortex, namely no interactions among vortices. But if you change the value of the quartic coupling G, you can have a situation where vortices would attract each other, that's a type one superconductor, or repel each other, that's a type two superconductor, and a type two superconductor would lead to this, uh, again, triangular lattice of these magnetic vortices. Okay, did I answer your question, Tianle? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. I think like it's related to like the type one and type two superconductors. Okay, good. Any further questions on this? Um, but the repulsion between the type two, between the vortices and the type two case is not log R, right? It's not log R. The, the, the potential actually dies off exponentially. And that's because of the fact that this is a Higgs mechanism and all the degrees of freedom have gaps and they have finite mass and therefore correlation length is short and everything dies off exponentially. In the case of the, uh, the, the global U1 vortices, then it's a global symmetry, so there's a number of on boson, that's a phonon, and exchange of phonon mediates long range force, and that's the origin of this logarithmic potential I mentioned earlier. So it's really a difference between global symmetry versus local symmetry. Okay. Is okay, Max? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So anyway, so this is the, a, a real experiment. And if you have the two type two superconductor, then you apply a magnetic field to it. And you can try to take a picture of where the magnetic fields are, for example, using the, uh, uh, the electron uh, 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 holography, then you can map out the location of the magnetic fields. And you can see that they do neatly line up in triangular lattice because again, because of the repulsive force among the vortices and the system try to minimize the energy because of that. And, and this is actually rather poor resolution, but this is an interesting example 
so 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 the, I, 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 I actually found this video uh, I, when I was already back in grad school and I was so moved by this uh, video. So uh, this is the demonstration. The vortices are indeed dynamical objects. So we solved the static equation of motion to find this vortex solution. But as I respond to some of the questions, the case of domain wall, you know, they can move. And, and, and indeed you see vortices moving here. And when the density of vortex was low at the beginning of this movie, they got attracted to uh, some uh, defects in the structure, uh, some kind of impurities, because that's where the uh, potential energy was minimized. But once the number of vortices increased, you saw that vortices really repelled each other and start to form sort of triangular structure. But once the number of vortices become so large that all the, the, uh, the lattice points of the triangular lattice are already occupied, they, they can't stay anymore then they start to flow. And that's what this video is showing. So all kinds of ideas we talked about already about the, the, the vortex solutions are all contained in this uh, single video clip. And, and so the vortices are really dynamical objects. They repel each other and they can move and even flow on a macroscopic scale. Right, any questions about this? Uh, so for the last picture where the, like, the, the lattice is saturated, does this mm -hmm. like, Break the superconductivity in the end because of you have a strong magnetic field here. Uh, well, so as you see in this video, it, this hasn't come to the point that the magnetic field would actually go above the critical field to break superconductivity because you can still uh, identify individual vortices. So this is presumably just slightly below the critical field where superconductivity is still there. It hasn't broken yet, but you have this large microscopic number of vortices already formed in the system. I see. It's interesting to see if they can. Yeah, yeah. That for yeah, it's it's really fascinating, isn't it? Any other questions here? Okay, and and so that's exactly what you have seen in the underground laboratory, where you put a piece of a superconductor on a permanent magnet. It flows on top of it, and that's because. The, uh, the, the magnetic field coming from permanent magnet actually uh, punches through the superconductor. And so you have this situation where you have multiple vortices, just like what this picture shows. And, and because of this pinning, then the magnetic field would actually end up levitating the piece of superconductor. So uh, this, this, uh, the lattice of vortices is really the origin of this uh, levitation of a superconductor in a magnetic field. All right. And uh, this, this was a context in condensed matter physics, but uh, you know, this is a, in some sense a speculation, but such a thing might have happened in the history of the universe as well. And we already know that uh, the universe went through this uh, you know, crossover when the electroweak symmetry was broken. And we also went through the phase transition when the chiral symmetry was broken by QCD. So the phase transitions seem to have happened multiple times in the early universe. So there could be also a phase transition of U1 symmetry uh, sometime in the early universe. And if that happens, then the, these vortices form what is called the cosmic strings. And uh, this is a numerical simulation how network cosmic strings would evolve over time. And uh, the, the energy of the string is obviously proportional to its length because the energy density is given by the two-dimensional field theory and the z direction is just the length of the string. So the network of strings would like to simplify itself by minimizing the overall length of the strings. And this evolution would require that the string would simplify itself by reconnection and, uh, and, and spinning out the loops and loops would shrink and so on. And that would actually emit the gravitational waves at the end of the day. And one of my recent papers talked about why such a cosmic string network is quite likely to be generated when the CISO mechanism explains the neutrino mass, which ends up also explaining the barrier asymmetry of the universe from the decay right and neutrinos. I mentioned this, I think, the last week. And so that this kind of network of cosmic string could be actually an evidence 
for such a mechanism to explain the uh, asymmetry between matter and antisymmetry. And the gravitational wave really has some limit from the LIGO. It hasn't really reached the energy scales relevant for this purpose, but the future missions might. So, uh, uh, so this is the kind of thing we, we might actually end up seeing in the future that the cosmic string network forms as topological defects in the universe, uh, giving rise to the gravitational wave signal, which is predicted to nearly scale invariant because the network keeps simplifying itself in a scale invariant fashion. And this scale invariance of the gravitational wave signal, if we actually manage to see it, would be a very concrete evidence that there was this strings form in early universe, which is the same thing as a of vortices in superconductor. So these things can happen in many different contexts in different areas of physics. In principle, we are yet to see evidence of such a cosmic string in cosmology, but that's something we can actually look forward to. All right, any questions about that? Okay, so now we'll move up to a, a, a higher dimension, and that's a skirmion. And this is again uh, one of the homework problems that you're looking at. So this is the Lagrangian for the ferromagnet. And I told you that the first term, uh, which has only one power and time derivative, is the, uh, the what you uh, uh, get as a Lagrangian for spin. And the uh, second term uh, just exhibits this uh, energy where the spins want to line up. And that's why uh, the derivative of the spin uh, comes in as a part of the energy. Uh, and so this is the Lagrangian for the ferromagnet. And n is meant to be a unit vector. And so the unit vector n with three components forms a space S2. It's a two-dimensional sphere because a spin can orient into one particular direction. And the, the way the spin can orient and ends up forming an entire solid angle, namely a two-dimensional sphere. So in this case, you can talk about the following uh, interesting map. So you have two-dimensional system, let's say, two-dimensional uh, Heisenberg ferromagnet, and two-dimensional space is R2, and you, you, so this is a sheet of paper. And take a sheet of paper, and imagine you wrap it around a ball, that's S2. So you can classify the configuration of the spins by a map of from R2 to S2, and then to the extent that uh, the ground states at infinity are, are all pointing the same direction so that you can identify the infinity, then your two-dimensional plane can be regarded as a two-dimensional sphere instead. Then you can classify the map as a, a map from S2 to S2 that's once again classified by the winding number. And that's a solution I've given you in a homework problem. And then you just derive the equation motion out of this and verify that this is indeed a non-trivial solution to the equation of motion. And the solution actually looks like this. So at the origin, <coughs> spins are pointing upwards in z direction. And as you move out in the radial direction, the spins start to sort of flatten uh, down to the horizontal direction, but it flattens out depending on which direction you are pointing to. So if you actually move to the right, a uh, positive x-axis, then spins start to flatten along the positive x-axis. If you move along the positive y-axis, then spins also try to flatten along the positive y-axis instead. And if you go all the way to the infinity, the spins are all pointing downwards at the end of the day. So that's this skirmion solution. And you can define the winding number of this map just by this simple integral, like what we have doing for the gauge theory as well. So ni, again, is the uh, uh, unit vector. And the spatial indices are mu and u. That defines a two-dimensional space. And uh, the spin direction, uh, ni, is contracted with this, uh, the Levitz beta symbol, so that this is manifestly invariant under the, the three-dimensional rotational spins. And it turns out that if you plug in the solution, this integrates to actually one. And uh, the skirmion can be moved around because you can choose the center of the skirmion. You can choose also the size of the skirmion, it turns out. Uh, this Lagrangian, uh, if you just look at the kinetic energy, turns out to have a scale invariance. So you can change the size of the skirmion without changing the energy. And so you have two, uh, uh, what is called the moduli for the solutions. And you can do a translation in x and y to move the centers around. You can change the size. 
And the, the changing the uh, orientation actually doesn't do much because that can be compensated by change of the spin orientation. But nonetheless, that's something you can also talk about. So that's a squamino solution. And uh, it turns out that uh, this is, again, one, one of the papers I re wrote uh, with a student in my class uh, some time ago. So if you actually look at the quantum physics of these squamions, you find this bizarre result that translation in the x direction and translation in the y direction don't commute. And how much they don't commute is given by this squamion number, which is an integer. So, uh, you know, this is a, a, a bizarre system where two translations don't commute, but you have seen this uh, in the presence of magnetic field, they don't commute. So it's kind of similar to that. And just like a magnetic field, when you push an electron, then the whole current moves actually sideways. So when you push a squamion, the squamion also moves sideways because of this non-commutativity of the translation uh, the generators. So anyway, that's a squamion in the two dimensions. And uh, the original squamion, uh, according to somebody named Skirm, S-K-Y-R-M-E, uh, actually studied this in three dimensions in a Chiro Lagrangian of strong interactions. But now squamion is more popular in the spin systems in condensed matter physics. And apparently the squamion can store information and, and it's, it's part of the, the major problem of spintronics these days, how to create devices for memory storage in a very compact uh, and stable fashion, actually using these chromium solutions. Anyway, so that's a very interesting example of the uh, two-dimensional soliton solution. Any questions about this? Um, in the denominator of the Lagrangian, should it be one plus nz or one minus nz? Uh, I think in the homework it's one minus nz. One minus nz. Ah, okay. So, uh, you know, it, it's actually the same. So, uh, the, this solution is, is uh, uh, regular when NZ is uh, uh, pointing upwards. 1 minus NZ is oh, expression that's regular when NZ is pointing downwards. And they are related by actually a, a surface term. And, and this is actually very much similar to the vector potential around the magnetic monopole I talked about, uh, I think, the last week. And uh, you can change sort of speak gauge, which is just a surface on the Lagrangian, which doesn't change the equation motion, but you choose a particular gauge where your expression looks regular. So the, whether you choose plus sign or minus sign actually gives you identical physics. Oh, I see. Thank you. All right. Any other questions here? Um, if, uh, yeah, um, so um, you mentioned how like these were initially studied in, in the context of like, um, I guess a more abstract like field theoretic method, but like huh? they're also um, like we find them in actual materials like in condensed matter systems. Yeah, yeah, so people did make a, a squamion. People even made a lattice of squamions. So this is something yeah. you can really produce in the laboratory. Yeah, and I, I guess I was wondering, would we maybe expect that, like, if we take a condensed matter system with, like, the great symmetry of, like, the field theory model, that it might be able to produce, like, these kind of generic types of quasi-particles or excitations, or does it, is it, like, more complicated than just finding, like, the symmetry is great? I, I don't know if my question is well posed, but... Uh, so, so your question just... is about whether there could be other condensed matter systems that show Skirmio solutions? Yeah, or I guess like if you wanted, like if you just kind of knew that like of the, like uh, if you were trying to search for one and we hadn't yet found one, like kind of how would you go about it? Would it just have to be looking for systems with the right symmetry or do you just get lucky? I, I... Uh, yeah, so uh, th there's a, a, another example where you can actually look at the liquid crystals. And if you have liquid crystals lined up uh, uh, on a plane, then each uh, uh, liquid, uh, the molecule, can point along in what, on one particular direction, right? So uh, that also forms a uh, space of uh, ground states, and which has non-trivial topology, and, and that would actually lead to a non-trivial soliton solution. And indeed, I am gonna talk about actually on the next couple of slides, a magnetic monopole, and let me just jump ahead and talk about it. Uh, then the pneumatic liquid crystal has monopole configurations. So each crystal can point in a radial direction, 
then the, the arrangement of crystal looks like something is sort of uh, you know the radially uh, the radiated, and and that's sort of similar to a magnetic field emanating out of the magnetic monopole, and so this existence of such a configuration of liquid crystal is also classified by topology. So that's yet another example in condensed matter systems where you can predict certain non-trivial configuration because of the uh, topology of the space of ground states. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So then let me explain the magnetic monopole here. So we talked about magnetic monopole briefly before and Dirac just came up with a, 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 a such a thing as a purely hypothetical object, but it turns out that Magnetic monopoles can arise as a solution to the equation motion of certain gauge theories. Then it's no longer something hypothetical, but ends up being a prediction out of a certain gauge theories. And now that I run off time, then I uh, delegate this uh, discussion discussion section later today. And but nonetheless, I, uh, so this is the way I try to cover uh, the, all the material of the part two and part three Pushkin Schroeder and add additional material has to do with the topological methods because that's kind of uh, uh, in vogue. There's a fashion of subject these days, both in particle physics and, and condensed matter physics. And I only touched upon these things and magnetic monopoly we discuss only in discussion section and not in the lecture today. But nonetheless, that's the way I try to wrap up the discussion of quantum field theory. And the quantum field theory, as you saw, is a vast subject. There are still many things I didn't really discuss. I didn't discuss much about conform field theory. I didn't discuss much about how this is applied to, for example, heavy quark effect field theory, uh, applied to nuclear physics, astrophysics. There are still many things you can actually look into. But where you go from here really depends on what kind of research you would like to do. And uh, uh, so if you want to know some uh, 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 subject in quantum field theory that you might be interested in, and then I, I can probably suggest something to read about to you, depending on what interest you might have uh, in your uh, research directions. OK, so that's it. So the semester is now over. Uh, there's still one homework left to do for you. I also yet to post the solutions at the previous homework. But nonetheless, uh, uh, please do all the homework. Make sure that you also fill out the uh, teaching evaluation form for me so that I can learn about what is the, uh, the sort of challenges about the online teaching myself and so I can improve upon them. And, and uh, yeah, so that's it. All right, so uh, have a good summer break. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Professor. Bye.